Welcome everyone to the webinar series, China in International Development. My name is Karen Zhu. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the India China Institute, and I'm the host of the webinar series. China's global engagement with countries in the developing world is rapidly evolving in an era where traditional aid discourses and the practices of emerging powers in international development are undergoing significant changes. As the largest South-South Corporation provider and the world's second largest economy, China's development activities overseas have sparked debates regarding its role as a rising power in international development and its implications for the post-liberal global order. Over the past few decades, China has substantially diversified its instruments and infrastructure in development practices. While some view China as a catalyst for new models of development and growth, others accuse China of being responsible for the debt crisis faced by many recipient economies. China's involvement in international development has led, wide, has led to wide ranging impacts. And this seminar series invites experts from five continents to engage in a three-part discussion on the instruments, finance, and infrastructures of China's international development. Today, we are really glad to have our first in the webinar series, where we explore the evolution and diversification of instruments in China's international development practices. And uh, tomorrow, we will have our, uh, uh, our second webinar, which focuses on um, Chinese development finance, the debt landscape, and how the global South perceive uh, its local impact. And on May 2nd, we will have our third webinar, uh, which discusses China's global infrastructure engagement as an example to illustrate the different actors and approaches in China's international development practices. Now, let me hand it over to our moderator today to introduce our panelists. Professor Mark Frazier. Professor uh, Mark Frazier is the Chair of Politics at the New School and Co-Director of the India China Institute. Uh, Professor Frazier, over to you. Thank you, Karen, and, and thank you for organizing this really exciting seminar series that's kicking off this morning here on the East Coast. Welcome to everyone from wherever you are joining us around the world. Uh, Karen has, has, as she said, uh, put together this uh, series uh, to look at instruments, finance, and infrastructures of China's international development. And today is instruments, uh, both, uh, as we'll see, uh, material and maybe less material forms of, of instruments uh, of China's international development practices. So I thank Karen for organizing it. I thank the panelists for, for, uh, for what their remarks they're about to give. And thank the audience for for coming and and remind you to please uh, remember uh, to to join the next two. Uh, so we will now uh, have uh, our panelists. Uh, let me introduce them quickly. We have Professor Tang Xiaoyang who will be speaking first. He's the chair and professor in the Department of International Relations at Tsinghua University, and his research uh, interests include political philosophy, China's engagement in developing countries and the global modernization process. He'll be talking today about overall trends in China in international development. The second speaker will be Professor Minye, who is Professor of International Relations at the Pardee School of Global Studies at Boston University. Her research is at the intersection of domestic and global politics, as well as economics and security, with a focus on China, India, and regional relations. I should also say we're very proud to have Professor Ye as a member of our ICI Board of Advisors. She's going to be talking about China's international development in light of the Belt and Road Initiative. Third will be Dr. Jennifer Bui, who is the chair of the Department of Global Health and an associate professor at Georgetown University. She's an epidemiologist by training, uh, with training in clinical medicine and quantitative research, and she has led research initiatives on the social determinants of health and, and global health equity, as well as security. She'll be talking about China's health cooperation abroad. Fourth, we'll hear from Professor Courtney Fung, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Security Studies and Criminology at Macquarie University. She's also Research Associate at the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard and an Associate Fellow at the Lowy Institute. 
She'll be talking about China in the security development nexus and the new initiatives that go under the rubrics of Global Development Initiative, Global Security Initiative, and Global Civilization Initiative, which were announced a couple of years ago. A quick word about housekeeping before we start the presentations. Uh, the chat function is, is disabled for this webinar, but please put your questions in the Q&A box and we will get to them after the panelists each speak for 10 to 12 min minutes and the panelists will uh, uh, start in sequence rather than returning uh, the, the the floor back to me so we can save time. Thank you. And we will begin now with Xiaoyang. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, yeah, while I'm sharing my slides, I would also like to add a self-introduction as I have a special relationship with the new school and with the Indian China Institute. I got my PhD in philosophy department at the new school uh, more than 10 years ago. And also I was uh, like the first student fellow of the Indian China Institute, which was founded uh, 2000, I think that was 2006. Actually, I remember that time uh, Mr. Joe Biden actually came to the inauguration ceremony and uh, that time he was still senator. Yeah, so time passed uh, very fast. And at that time I actually knew nothing about Africa and uh, I was just studying uh, Plato and uh, Kant and Hegel. That's what I learned in new school. But I actually during that period, uh, I also started to work on China and Africa since uh, that time the China's uh, development cooperation grow very fast. And actually this is the book cover of uh, my uh, book on China and Africa cooperation. And uh, I think that will set uh, the idea of co-evolutionary pragmatism will be the theme of my introduction of China's diversifying uh, development instruments internationally. So using Africa as a, the example, so China's uh, uh, trade uh, with Africa is more than Ch uh, Africa's trade with the US, Japan, France, and the UK combined, and it's ever uh, still growing. And uh, China also in construction, and it takes uh, more than 60% of the Africa's uh, market. And the FDI as well growing, as well as then the FOCAC, which uh, means the Ch Forum of China-Africa Cooperation. Uh, in this uh, September, we will see a new FOCAC meeting between China and uh, Afri Chinese and African leaders. And uh, what are the Chinese uh, approaches in Africa and uh, how did China become so influential? <clears throat> there were a lot of uh, uh, yeah, literature and opinions from authoritarian, neoliberal, neocolonialism to land grab, but also to some more positive friendship and win-win. But actually, I, my key word for China's approach in Africa is just about diverse, flexible, and pragmatic. So that also means China doesn't follow any model, not even its own model. And uh, the uh, impacts of this diversity is it aims to uh, drive, and indeed it has already driven quite a lot of uh, industrial transformation, and uh, it's set to continue in this trend as well. And uh, so the ta uh, this uh, industrial transformation, the target is to sustain productivity growth. And that's actually the conviction of uh, Chinese uh, uh, leaders, uh, government, as well as the public since uh, the market reform, which was uh, which started in 1978 or roughly uh, 1980s, we can also say that. And uh, um, this is uh, uh, China's uh, learning a uh, lesson from uh, uh, this uh, in, yeah, the, by facing the capitalism, the challenge of capitalism. Since uh, after the Cultural Revolution, China found uh, just uh, itself was too backward or weak in productivity facing this very advanced uh, uh, capitalist economies in the West. So therefore, then China actually started to uh, pursue this productivity growth. 
And uh, then how to pursue this productivity growth, then it comes Karl Marx. That's also what I learned from new school uh, 10, yeah, 15 years ago. I read the capital in new school uh, in New York. So that's a good place to study uh, Karl Marx. And uh, so Karl Marx actually for me, the most important uh, concise understanding is uh, to understand the capital really as a uh, continuous growth. Not only this is actually because uh, Ma uh, Max Weber share the same uh, ideas and some other thinkers, but Karl Marx uh, write it in this uh, general formula, which very concisely described uh, ma uh, capital is just from money into commodity and then to more money to get more surplus. And uh, to uh, so this endless pursuit of surplus will stimulate continuous uh, productivity growth. In fact, China learned, so China is a Marxist uh, still, uh, the Chinese Communist Party as a Marxist party, but it also learned a lot from uh, Karl Marx on this uh, criticism on the capitalist, but uh, by actually being quite capitalistic. So actually Chinese uh, government now is also promoting this uh, capital increase, capital surplus, and also st to stimulate continuous productivity growth. And this idea is even shared by Chinese government with other countries, developing countries, as a secret to, uh, yeah, for the country's development. Not really secret, but as a, some like, uh, uh, yeah, keywords for uh, development. And then to stimulate this productivity growth, from Adam Smith, we already know the greatest improvement is the productive in the productivity uh, productive powers has been the effects of the division of labor, and that's the first sentence of uh, Wealth of Nation, and that's still true. So as this picture say in Ethiopia five years ago just showed how on this top left it's the traditional Ethiopia shoemaker. He can do everything very skillful but very low in uh, productivity. While in this uh, uh, down yeah, on the right, this picture is a Chinese factory, new investment and the workers, they just came to the factory one week or two weeks. But they when they put in the assembly line and do the division of labor, their productivity efficiency increased uh, um, hundreds of times. And so this makes the great transformation, as Karl Polanyi said. And uh, this great transformation actually is uh, about the transformation from agrarian society to the industrial capitalism. And its a key point is uh, uh, about the pursuit in the agrarian society, it was more like a subsistence production and the limited exchange, largely self-sufficient. And to turn it into an industrial capitalism, it's uh, to pursue the capital and need mass production, specialized division of labor, and also then mass distribution the market, and then need a corresponding political and societal and environmental changes. And this is uh, what uh, the Europe also experienced in its uh, uh, yeah, industrial revolution, as Karl Polanyi actually depicted the 18th, 19th century Europe. But China also in experienced that during last 40 years in the, this uh, comprehensive transformation. And that's also when China talks to the developing countries, they said the same thing. You should uh, pursue productivity growth, development, but also by changing the whole production system, style, and the lifestyle, and then the society in, uh, all together. But then it's the qu question, because when you want to change the whole society, a lot of components are interdependent on each other. And uh, so it's uh, some often you have a chicken and egg dilemma. So I listed some of like functioning market, skilled workers, as well as uh, urbanization infrastructure. They often like interconnected. And uh, so therefore, the, there was uh, the equilibrium of uh, subsistence, uh, old style production. And then also the equilibrium of industrial capitalism, the new industrial transformation. How to move that? Actually, there's no rule. Chinese, that's the Chinese uh, uh, experience. No rule. Actually, not only 
uh, China didn't follow others. Even within China, each region, like the northern east or the southern delta, uh, yeah, the Pearl River delta, or the Yangtze River delta, and the west region, they each region, they may have a different paths because of their traditions and the culture and the existing structure. And also in the different time in China, sometimes in the 90s, maybe it's more like a liberal and private companies come in, but in some early 21st century, some state-owned companies getting more strategic importance. But also during the last several years, these private high-tech companies again takes the lead. And all this is actually more about trial and error gradualism and the co-evolution. So that's about the co-evolution as a whole. And they will work, and but the government, it's just a part of it. And do it's like a coach in the soccer team trying to do some coordination and the instruction, that's it. And uh, yeah, so that's also then come to uh, Chinese government's idea saying, ah, oh, there, there uh, do not follow our model. That's Deng Xiaoping already said uh, 40 years ago to Ghanaian leaders. And uh, then uh, also there's this uh, idea of uh, cross the river by touching stones. And that's still today's uh, Chinese principle and also China's uh, uh, development, uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, so pattern is the same. So there's, this is a, a comparison between the linear, more like a linear model and the conditionality of uh, the Washington consensus versus Chinese model. And then very quickly, this uh, because of this like principle, then like China's trade with Africa spreads much more with more different countries. And like the US, it's a, like a relatively concentrated in several better off rich countries because of the like uh, avoid uh, to avoid the risk or to grab more, become more profitable. And also yet when it comes to like a market regulation, although there are a lot of discussion on like a quality of Chinese products, actually the Chinese product in Africa range from like maybe some of the lowest quality, but also to the highest quality. So this is actually the diversity and to fit the demands of African today's economic status. But sometimes the regulation and the government coordination will work uh, hand in hand. The infrastructure, that's a very important part, but China, China doesn't have uh, any like a specific model. I think uh, we actually will, in the following discussion, we will see the financing and the debt that's related. We see these uh, models are always changing. And uh, then the manufacturing, they address the current industrial deficiency in Africa. As we see here, actually, Africa uh, need to get a lot of uh, yeah, the value chain, a lot is in Asia. And uh, China then try to do a lot of uh, this uh, local marketing and uh, try to uh, work with the local entrepreneurs, uh, uh, workers all together to develop the products for local market. So we, I have a lot of stories, but I, I just skip because of time reason, I, I do not uh, say too much. And all this then also come to a, a very interesting people may call Chinese style model of special economic zones. But even the special economic zones, uh, that's uh, uh, yeah, China build uh, six uh, like economic cooperation zones, uh, national nation level cooperation zones with Africa. But even these uh, zones, they have very diverse models. The Egypt ones are very different from the Zambia ones. And uh, even Nigeria has two zones, but the two zones have very different paths. And uh, for them, they just have the uh, one goal of uh, like uh, um, develop of uh, increasing uh, productivity and also uh, fostering tra urbanization transformation. But uh, to how to do that? Actually, they have a lot of uh, different uh, their methods, and uh, also then depends a lot on synergetic uh, development between industrial urbanization, between enterprise and the government altogether. Okay, I think I will end here and welcome your comments and discussion. Thank you. Okay, so uh, good morning or good evening.
uh, or good uh, sometime. <laughs> uh, this is a global webinar, so I suppose there are different audience from different continents. Uh, I, I want to thank Karen for uh, organizing this program and uh, Mark uh, Frazier for moderating the session. And Professor Tang's um, uh, research report is very uh, rich and the book is uh, intriguing. So that will be my uh, next to, to, to read the list. Uh, so I, I guess what I prepared uh, in terms of the Belt Road Initiative uh, is a uh, um, it is, is kind of a critical test of, of the Chinese uh, uh, go global um, uh, efforts or the Chinese models application uh, and co-evolution with, with the world and what does it mean for, for China and uh, the world um, in, the, in the future. So let me uh, first uh, recap uh, the, 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 a few in, important points that I made in my uh, recent book, The Belt Road and the Young, uh, published in 2020. Um, so the Belt Road and Beyond, or, or the, the Belt Road Initiative uh, uh, launched by, uh, by the current leadership in 2013, but I, um, uh, uh, I, I found that it was really rooted in the Chinese uh, domestic development uh, model going global. And so the idea was that uh, as an industrial um, status the economy, and, uh, and they uh, planned their industrial and technology development uh, with the aim to um, utilizing access in domestic and international markets and domestic international resources. And that idea came from the late 1990s, Jiang Zemin uh, uh, period, and then carried out by the Hu Jintao period. And so the go out policy was uh, was quite a, a significant predecessor to the Belt Road Initiative. Uh, moreover, the um, the domestic development uh, driving the uh, Belt Road Initiative in two thousand thirteen was very much Chinese capacity in and strength in infrastructure construction development as well as its associated machinery and the material development, right? So within China, that um, that that sector, that industry appeared to um, pick. And so the going global became a very essential part of the extension. And they, they indeed, so from 2014 to 2017, in the uh, BII phase one, we uh, observed rapid rise of China's um, uh, investments in infrastructure, and uh, or, um, and the uh, uh, Chinese uh, infrastructure was really uh, investment and construction was meeting the global demand or the gap infrastructure gap that uh, that China's um, BII was was meeting. But then in two thousand seventeen. The, the, that infrastructure-driven uh, BRI development seemed uh, to help pick. And uh, we begin to see the stagnation or decline in, uh, in overseas investments, construction and loans in the infrastructure um, project. And why? And so I, I think that that uh, stagnation or picking was driven by uh, domestic conditions, but also international conditions. Uh, number one, domestically, the, the Chinese uh, capacity or overcapacity in infrastructure construction and its uh, related sectors have largely been eased. And then outside China, despite the infrastructure gap remained, uh, but the financing capability for more infrastructure construction actually was not there anymore. And then uh, China-led infrastructure development also caused a significant backlash uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the global uh, north and uh, uh, valuing the global south's public opinions, popular pushback. So in other words, um, uh, 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 China's uh, Capacity, domestic capacity was more or less uh, uh, elevated, uh, 
uh, elevated, and then the idea of um, stimulating a global <laughs> infrastructure uh, development frenzy like in China, that's not likely. So did the BRI just die or stagnate after 2017? Well, the, uh, the, the investment flow um, uh, and the construction uh, data shows an overall stagnation. But then quickly we uh, find in particular in recent couple of years, uh, we begin to see this rebirth of the BRI in the uh, green um, uh, sectors, the green BRI, the, the, the birth of green BRI uh, starting 2017, but reached a pretty high point in after 2020. So the green BRI um, uh, has, a, a, in terms of, uh, the, in, the refers to, uh, infrastructure which have, have more uh, uh, re renewable energy and uh, uh, wind, solar, battery, uh, renewable trans uh, uh, green transportation, a uh, uh, clean um, vehicle, uh, clean energy vehicles, battery vehicles, etc. So those sectors are coming from China, are rising very significantly in in exports in investments, in constructions, and as well as, as loans. Um, uh, 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 just last year, uh, China uh, dominated uh, the world's EV markets production and exports. So China has become the world's largest uh, electrical vehicle exporter, uh, uh, and, uh, the, the largest uh, uh, vehicle uh, automobile exporter uh, due to its EV dominance. The Chinese company uh, BYD has uh, already surpassed um, Tesla in terms of production and uh, exports. So other than the, the EV story and China solar um, and wind and other renewable uh, sectors are really um, very dominant and rising, so um, so 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 I I think the the green BRI was driven by this domestic capacity developments, um, and, and how did this happen? Right? So how did China? So this the 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 incredible story was really how China changed with a, a infrastructure led domestic economy to a green industry-led uh, domestic economy uh, from 2017 to 2022, that that's, that's in itself was really worthwhile to investigate. Uh, and roughly we can identify that uh, from the policy uh, perspective, uh, the national um, government uh, 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 super ministry, right? The National Development and Reform Council, and in collaboration with other national uh, agencies, were uh, really persistent and uh, dedicated enormous efforts to to support um, the green sector's development. And coupled with these political leaders' consistent um, signaling, mobilization, and so we can also observe that the, um, the state-owned companies, including the banks and uh, the construction energy resources, state-owned companies and local governments have all kind of shifted to support renewable energies and, and, and green sectors. And these uh, kind of nationwide efforts to, uh, to transition from um, regular, from conventional infrastructure industry to the green industry and, and, and new energies uh, is, has, was shown to be quite effective. Um, so does that mean that um, this China's green BRI will be a, a relative smooth sail uh, worldwide, in particular as uh, globally, uh, most of countries face enormous challenges to uh, transition into 
uh, green development and uh, address the climate uh, crisis all, all of us are, are subject to. Right? So we can, it's safe to say that the world has a significant green deficit or green gap uh, in, that needs to be filled. So uh, uh, in, 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 in fact, because the development is so recent, we can we 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 know that the Chinese uh, green capacity building domestically was aiming for the international market and international resources as well. So so will this kind of a win win uh, for for the world and for China? Um, I I I am more. Uh, hesitant to offer this opinion. Uh, in fact, I think the, the Chinese uh, uh, green BRI will experience a similar fate as, uh, as the, the, the previous uh, BRI. That is, China does have the capacity to dominate and to sell more uh, to international market. Uh, but unfortunately, the developing countries who are more willing and more open to China's green exports, investment, and constructions are unlikely to have the financing capabilities to, to produce the green miracles as China uh, uh, conducted itself. And then globally, the advanced economies due to their own ambition to develop domestic green uh, technology and sector, as well as the geopolitical concerns of having too much uh, uh, new sectors from dominated by China. So in other words, the, the global North is likely to oppose China's green BRI, the global South is not going to have the capacity to take in the Chinese uh, green uh, industry. So we'll see that in a few years, um, the, the, the green sector, green BRI will face some more problems. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Jennifer Bowie. I'm really uh, privileged to be on this uh, very distinguished uh, panel. So I'm going to talk about China's health assistance programs. Let me try to share uh, a set of slides. All right, uh, does it work? Yes. Um, Great, thank yes. you. So, um, so the title is the critical review of China's health assistance programs from two, year 2000 to uh, 2000, 2021. So I'm uh, leading a global health program at Georgetown University, but this research is sponsored mostly by uh, REN Corporation, as well as uh, the coll collaboration uh, with the aid data. Uh, so uh, this work cannot be done without their, using their public data on Global China Finance Database 3.0. So why we're interested in China's health assistance? Um, I, I think this is a very unique and a little bit different uh, from the BRI initiative, even though uh, in the last 10 years, many of these programs are considered as uh, part of the BRI, but we know that health and education are more uh, uh, geared towards a soft power uh, and not on the market uh, and uh, technology. Uh, however, uh, this has been counted uh, as B BRI too. But I want to highlight a few questions we have uh, on the China's health assistance. Uh, one is what is it? Uh, what constitutes uh, these programs? And what's the scale uh, of these uh, the impact and the impact of these programs. And secondly, how is different, uh, differently governed uh, than the other programs uh, compared to the BRI and overseas investment? And thirdly, what are the challenges? So as you can see on the Lies the right side of the this chart showing that uh, the data we have uh, is only from 2000 to 2021. 
but you can see that even uh, in these 20, a little bit over 20 years, that uh, the number of projects has been increasing steadily. And uh, in the last two years during the, um, the pandemic, it really dwarfed the many other uh, projects uh, in, in terms of scale and in terms of input. But I also want to highlight uh, the characteristic of the health assistance program because it has a long history. So it started in 1963 when China sent out its first uh, China, uh, uh, the China medical uh, team uh, to Algeria uh, during the uh, colonial war uh, over there. Uh, so it, it has been uh, quite steady over all these, all, all these years. And second characteristic I would say is it is a small and beautiful. So many of you may have heard uh, recently talking about China's uh, global development uh, uh, initiative and looking for projects uh, that are small and beautiful. And I would say the health assistance program, most of them uh, fit this uh, characteristics. So using the uh, the database we found the health uh, program projects including the pandemic uh, assistance programs vaccine assistance programs takes about 19 percent of all the uh, china's overseas projects in terms of uh, the uh, the uh, dollar amount it's only it's less than one percent so it's uh, quite large in number of projects but relatively uh, cheap um, so the third characteristic uh, I would say is the type of uh, the pro projects and the distribution has varied from uh, different stages uh, over all these over almost half a century history. So on the right, I listed some of the main uh, types of the China health assistance projects. Uh, start with the uh, China medical team because this one has the longest history and also uh, governed by a, a, a little bit different uh, system uh, in the agency, uh, Chinese agencies, which I will show a map later. Um, but what's dominant uh, these uh, number of projects has been the donation of medical products that including the vaccines, the medicine, anti-malarial medicine in particularly, uh, and some of the other products. Facility construction also has a long history. Uh, this means the buildup of hospitals, of anti-malaria clinics, and in recent years, some of the uh, state-of-the-art uh, labs uh, in, in Africa. Uh, grants and donations, both uh, to the uh, multilateral organizations like WHO and U UNDP, uh, UNICEF, as well as uh, the bilateral uh, direct donation from China to a third a recipient country uh, are grouped in this category. Training and expert uh, consultation has been uh, also quite consistent over the years. And in since 2010, there we see more of the large teams on humanitarian aids uh, that sent from China. And then there's also uh, mission programs such as uh, what they call the Guangmingxing, Ai Xinxing. So those are uh, targeting specific uh, diseases. So using the database, we did uh, ch looked at all the number of projects uh, we found globally from year 2000 there, uh, we screened out more than nearly 4,000 of these projects. And uh, as you can see, the, do uh, the donation of medical products, including vaccine, uh, that has been dominating uh, the numbers. Uh, next to that is the Chinese teams that's including both civilian and the military medical teams and the other uh, projects. We also look at uh, of all these different types, how this evolve over time. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, overall number of projects has been increasing uh, over uh, since uh, year 2000, uh, but we can see that medical teams, uh, humanitarian aid, uh, some of the mission programs and constructions in general are increasing uh, over this time. 
And we also looked at uh, this disease specific, especially, especially the, um, the infectious disease uh, specific projects. We see that malaria uh, targeted project high, it was uh, peaked uh, between 2009 to 2010. I think there was a large, uh, it was a short time period where there are lot, lots of anti-malaria uh, clinics as well as the um, the uh, uh, medicine donation during that time, but that program has um, encountered issues with the quality and also the recipient countries complain. Uh, so that was stopped. That that itself is an interesting story. Um, but we also see that uh, it almost complement uh, like TB and HIV. Uh, these uh, targeted projects. Um, uh, came out before and after the malaria dominated uh, projects. So we, I talked about uh, the distribution uh, and uh, the projects, uh, the type of projects change over different historical period. So this would be, uh, some of these uh, statistics will be published in two of the publication. One uh, is uh, sponsored by the RAND Corporation that we're going to build a toolkit and a research uh, report later this year that will be published later this year. And the, the part that specific on Africa uh, will be is sponsored by the Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Development that will also come up later this year. So I will just very quickly uh, talk about the, the, the five stages I uh, focused on uh, in those reports. Uh, so I will say the first stage is of, uh, before 1978. So that's the, I call it a socialist era. Uh, this is at the peak of the, the Cold War and most of the uh, health development uh, projects are ministered through the Foreign Affairs Ministry. And uh, it's mainly targeting the developing countries, uh, building solidarity and helping China to get it back into WHO as well as UN. Um, and then between to, uh, 1980 to 2000, I see that as China focusing on its own uh, economic development. Uh, so at that time, during those time, that actually these programs shrink, uh, shrunk compared to the earlier period uh, and compared to after 2000. So from 2001 to 2012, uh, that's when China first entered the WTO and seeing the pouring of FDIs, uh, foreign development uh, investment coming to uh, to the to China. Coupled with the uh, SARS uh, that really changed the China's public health system, uh, we see that during this time, most of the projects are uh, ministered by the MoveCon, which is the Com uh, department, as well as through uh, the uh, Ministry of Health. So we later I will show you a map that showing many of these projects are focusing on the resource rich country because China is building its factories for the world and need lots of energy and, and resources. So I will say it's market driven uh, and resource driven. And then comes the, the BRI after 2013. Again, our map shows that these uh, health development program, uh, again, uh, start to focus on humanitarian aid as well as the BRI countries. And of course, COVID uh, brings the vaccine, China, Chinese vaccine to the, to, to the world. That's a different, uh, a different era. So here's here are the maps. Uh, 2000 to 2012, we see the most of the 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 the, the red, uh, the warm color shows the more projects in those countries. I we only did this for Africa, and you can see that um, uh, Angola and Nigeria. These are the countries that uh, have um, more rich uh, uh, mining as well as resource, the, the oil energy uh, resources. Those are the focus for those years. And then after uh, 2013, we see the West Africa countries that uh, that's 
probably due to the Ebola, when China sent out the largest team uh, in its history on humanitarian aid, but also the BRI countries on the uh, east coast uh, of, um, of uh, Africa. And then uh, this is a map from the bridge Beijing showing the China's vac COVID vaccine distribution. As you can see, it's much wider uh, than uh, the previous projects. So I would just uh, use a couple of slides talking about the, what are the challenges uh, and what's um, looking forward. Uh, so typically, China's uh, one criticism of China's medical uh, or health initiatives are that uh, we don't quite know uh, its lack of transparency. We don't really know the numbers and what's its, uh, how it's evaluated uh, internally. Um, but we see some recent uh, recent years that there are more and more of the Chinese agency are working with uh, United Nations and working with international uh, uh, academia as well as organizations to build these projects and have these projects evaluated uh, using uh, global standards. So I think that's a, a good trajectory, but this still very new and only a few projects uh, are under this type of projects. Um, the other uh, future directions I see uh, is that there's more, inter more interesting in interest uh, in the Africa local production of medical uh, device and wondering if China's uh, infrastructure building can continue to support that initiative. The transparency and coordinations among different agencies in, in inside China are uh, has been in discussions, and uh, I foresee more uh, 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 investment in that. I think the relatively new Sitica uh, buildup uh, will uh, help that initiative. Uh, medical team, as I said, has a long history and it's a really a flag uh, for the China's uh, medical programs. However, I think uh, it's been half a century, but whether it should still keep its own uh, original formats that sending a, a team to the country to help, uh, whether that's still relevant uh, and whether it's uh, we should thinking more about health, health system strengthening rather than just a few experts. So that's also in the debate. And finally, finally, the training uh, will probably fo focus more on the global health system and surveillance rather than uh, the training on the clinical side. So this is, I would say, the uh, one of the last slides uh, relates to this topic is showing uh, the enormous uh, uh, agency collaborations and agency uh, uh, dividends of uh, the, the different part, different types of projects. I would just say, highlight that most of these projects are directed by the three agencies, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Commerce, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. However, the medical team uh, are related to the National Health and Family Planning uh, Commissions, uh, and the training are related to the education uh, de departments. And then many of the finance uh, for especially the, the medical products are related to some of the uh, China's uh, export uh, policy banks. So most of these uh, charts you have seen are produced by the team at RAND. I want to acknowledge some of our PhD students there. And lastly, I want to highlight that we use the same data set uh, and also looked at the China's AI report export last year and this is uh, available on uh, rent uh, website and last month when i was in in beijing i found this report actually was, was translated and published by the wenhua zongheng uh, so uh, with that i will end my presentation and hand the floor to courtney thank you Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much to colleagues Curran, um, Mark, Nim, Grace, Xiaoyang, Jennifer, um, for having me join the panel today. And I would like to just note that unlike all the other colleagues who spoke with great detail and many with wonderful slides, I will just be talking at a much more general level, um, probably at around about 10,000 feet versus sort of the real tactical granular information that you've just heard. Um, 
And my contribution to the panel today will really be to sort of talk about the larger context of where China has been considering. Um, Chinese elites have been considering their contributions with these sort of global public goods and the changing definition of infrastructure. So I guess in the context of a very short presentation, I have about 10 minutes. I'd like to just offer the bottom line up front. And my own research view, I think we are at, a, at an inflection point. Um, already colleagues have mentioned um, the Global Development Initiative, GDI, a lot of detail discussing all of the efforts with health assistance, the changing nature of BRI and its goals and structure. So that was the first two presenters. But I would actually argue if we broaden our focus beyond the development sector, um, we can start to see moves by Chinese elites now to help us understand, A, that China is presenting a suite of global public goods. And so China itself is becoming a primary actor in terms of global public good provision. And B, more importantly, perhaps, a tighter connection between the concepts of security and the concepts of development. And so in this way, putting a very clear approach that development is going to be the master key to addressing all problems and including a variety of security problems too. So what I'd like to do with the remainder of my presentation is really focus on the context, um, this sort of build up to where we've arrived today with these new global public goods along with BRI, um, GDI, the Global Security Initiative, GSI, and the Global Civilization Initiative, GCI, and then to conclude with some comments about where things might go. So what I'd like to do is just to remind everyone that it's very well worth it to go back and read um, this September 2023 speech on the proposal on reform and development of global governance. Um, there was a very spirited um, MOFA Q&A session about this also back in September 2023. But this speech is very important because it helps solidify the views that China has already had 10 years of the community of common destiny of humankind, sometimes also referred to as shared future or the community of common destiny. So two other shorthands in English. And the view that China has taken this idea, its own vision for global governance, a series of flex flexible, functional, um, bilateral or multilateral partnerships. So for example, if states can find the ability to cooperate on matters of international trade, then two states, China and its partner should, with perhaps less concern about human rights issues, if they cannot see eye to eye on these matters, then they can set these aside. Um, the view that states should have greater dialogue and discussion, um, the idea of reaching perhaps sometimes even consensus and political consultation to resolve issues. But in this idea of, of this global community of common destiny, there is still this concept that China will be the lead partner and you know, there, that there is a hierarchy, that smaller states can be consulted, other states can be um, consulted in their views, but ultimately it is still China that really is in the pole position, the first amongst equals. And there is this implicit recognition of the superiority perhaps of the Chinese domestic political system. So while being very broad and very flat, um, some aspects of this global community of common destiny um, is perhaps less so. But so part of the speech was to remind everyone that China has gone from idea to action and from vision to reality. So that China now is moving on implementing this community of common destiny. And it's part of this longer rhetorical effort that Beijing has been making to help refocus our attention upon the flaws of what China terms as the Western led world order um, and to sort of highlight the flaws and the issues introduced by this Western led world order. So for example, problems of regime change as introduced by the Iraq and Afghanistan wars and the outcomes that we now see in Egypt and Syria and elsewhere that have shown perhaps that the Western approach on um, this robust promotion of liberal international order, um, democracy tenants and um, things like this have actually led to degradations of what China sees as a separate international order that China wants to be a contributor, upholder, and key reformer of. Um, in this sense, there is this need to introduce Chinese wisdom, ideas, and solutions into the reform of international order, which China sees itself as a core player in. 
So this would be the family of United Nations bodies, the principles of international law. Um, and these are all examples of international order that China can seek to reform and support. Again, reminding us that sometimes the cost to this international order are driven by outcomes of a Western-led order. So again, this Western-led world order and this international order are two separate concepts, even though in English they're quite often interchanged. But the reason why this matters is that in this last decade, we've seen a move now that China is making a case that it is now actually enacting this community of common destiny by its provision of global public goods. Um, and the permutations of these global public goods, we see a global community of security, a global community of civilizations, and a global community of development. Um, the GDI was sort of the first announced global public good using this term that they've now sort of elevated as in either it's BRI plus the three or it's just the three GIs that are added together. And so in September of 2021, um, there was this push to talk about this global development initiative. And as Curran has written about, and also as Jennifer noted, many of these projects are seen to be small and beautiful. Um, but again, putting forward this idea that through people to people training, through people-to-people -people exchange, technology transfer, um, education, et cetera, um, there is this belief that somehow China can help promote development and that China is doing so in the view that development is the master key to address all problems. So again, um, if I can focus on the United Nations space, my own particular research area, we can see that GDI has become actually quite um, well introduced into the UN system. And in many ways, it has multiple natural partners within that particular um, policy ecosphere. So for example, a large and growing group of friends, depending on who you talk to, there could be a count anywhere between 70 to 100 states that are part of the group of friends. Um, also the endorsement of the Secretary General himself for, the, for this particular GDI um, initiative as something that will support UN goals. DESA is really the key leading body within the UN system. This is a Department of Economic and Social Affairs based in the Secretariat in New York that China has had the leadership position of for the last three decades. Um, and again, these GDIs link very well with other SDGs. And China can be selective over which of the sustainable development goals that China seeks to support. So perhaps it's less surprising that there is um, limited GDI linkage with SDG 16 that talks about the need for there to be um, reformed justice systems, for example. And we can then move and see by sort of April of 2022, the introduction of the Global Security Initiative, followed by a concept paper in February of 2023. Um, this one is a very fascinating case because it is a real move for China to say that it provides security goods and that China is clear that it can articulate what its preferences are in terms of a global security order. So it's a move from saying we are less interested in this US-led world order with all of its problems that come with it, to also be able to say, all of that said, we ourselves are able to offer security goods in ways that actually will support a global security order and support an international order. Um, again, we've seen that these are tied to a variety of regional initiatives within the Global South. So, for example, the China-Africa Cooperation Vision 2023, a variety of bilateral agreements endorsing and supporting BRI um, with partners like Syria, Cuba, and the like. Um, again, the endorsement at the June 2022 BRICS Summit. But actually, it's been quite interesting about the attempt to try and link GSI into the UN space, right? Um, in many ways, you would assume that this would be a very fertile space for China to bring this global security initiative into being, um, given that the concept paper discusses China's efforts with counterterrorism, peacekeeping, etc. But actually, the introduction at this point has been very tentative, focused really at sort of these rotating um, presidential statements at the UN Security Council. So each UN Security Council member will take on the presidency sequentially month by month. Um, and so China has really only introduced GSI in this particular space. We've not seen the language introduced um, into various resolutions, for example, yet. And then of course, um, introduced last year, last March, um, the reference to the Global Civilization Initiative. 
And really, this is where China is seeking to help remind states of the relevance of their unique um, economic, social, cultural, and historic backgrounds that will help determine each state's individual path in terms of seeking modernity, security, um, and peace. So really emphasizing the importance of cultural relativism and therefore challenging the basis of there being universal and fundamental rights that are common to all persons and all peoples. Um, in this space, we're also waiting to see where this will move. We've seen tentative movements already, introduction of GCI related language into ECOSOC, um, various human rights related architectures, um, UNESCO, and even the third committee that runs um, again out of New York. Um, I think the next big marker will be really um, coming up next month, the 21st of May will be um, the World Day for Cultural Diversity for Dialogue and Development. And I think we're gonna be seeing potentially a large launch of GCI efforts that particular day. So it's, I think for everyone to stay tuned. But I think again, the combination of these global initiatives is really to emphasize that again, China is itself a key player, not just looking towards the West um, in terms of being these global public good providers. And again, this very clear linkage now between China's own approach, emphasizing security and development. And I'd like to take just one short example um, to sort of highlight what this is about. So for example, um, in the case to do with the Ukraine crisis, the Ukraine war, um, Chinese officials are very careful about the language they use regarding Ukraine. Um, this has been controversial for Beijing on a number of fronts, but I will say one angle we can focus on is this introduction of this term indivisible security within its GSI language. Um, again, many scholars have pointed out, and there's excellent research on this, that the term indivisible security is not new for the party and not new in the Chinese foreign policy lexicon. It is again part of the SEO charter. We can see references to indivisible security by Chinese elites going back to the Korean War, for example. And again, of course, a larger heritage of the term um, within European politics and security arch architecture in relation to the 1975 Helsinki Act, for example. But of course, the most recent interpretation of the term has been applied by Moscow in terms of its own self-justification for invading Ukraine. And again, the adoption of the term into Chinese foreign policy at this moment has been seen as sort of tipping China's hat um, in terms of its friendship um, between Moscow and Beijing. But I think the reason why this particular case is of interest in terms of us watching these sort of broader strategic developments is because China's own emphasis on the way that it's thinking about the Ukraine crisis, again, is really talking about security and development and the role of development in terms of supporting security. So for example, um, Chinese commentary has been very clear about the need for political solutions, consultation, um, pragmatic and calm discussions, um, the very limited responses that will be found by using a security, um, how do I say, an armed conflict approach first. But also, there's also been very clear language where China has been repeatedly um, emphasizing the need to sort of rethink the way that the sanctions regime has worked. And the real need to really think about how we bring about global food aid and the effects of the sanctions um, in terms of reducing the access to global food aid, which is what matters for many states in the global South, right? The Ukraine crisis can be interpreted in many ways, this particular war. And the Chinese frame has been to talk about the erosion of the global food aid access. And again, this is not because Ukraine itself is a key supplier of global food aid, i.e. its ability as a global wheat basket for aid, but the fact that sanctions are actually eroding and, degre and degrading um, the way that we can think about promoting aid. So again, China's real pushback on this has been the need to remove sanctions and the need to think twice about the way that multilateral and bilateral sanctions are being used. And again, Chinese officials are very clear when they talk about Ukraine, they're less interested in using that sort of Western led security frame, talking about invasion and conflict, as much as they are talking about the second order problems that have come out of this particular Ukraine crisis. So in my last minute, I'd just like to highlight three ways that we can sort of 
pay attention to the way that these global initiatives are moving. Um, I think first off, we have to be clear that for many of these initiatives, China is seeking to rehat existing efforts. So for example, GSI, many of the things noted in the concept paper are not new. Um, there are evolutions of projects already begun 20, 30, 40 years ago um, with China's own contributions throughout the UN system. Um, I think it then leaves us space to consider where things might go, just as Nin has talked about the multiple phases and the same as Xiao Yang talked about the multiple phases of BRI evolution, that I think there is space to think about the multiple phases of GSI as evolution, as we proceed to work through crises in Gaza, um, Ukraine and the like. Um, I think a second point for us to also consider is the fact that the Chinese um, diplomats have found themselves to be very reactive and very nimble in terms of their foreign policy flexibility. So the way that they engage the global south, um, the large variety of 130 something states that fall into this category um, within the United Nations body, they've been able to really pull upon um, the fact that there's been a push for UN reform um, led by the Secretary General himself and also by these states from the bottom up, seeking for new ways that we think about multilateral development and we think about multilateral engagement. And so this real dissatisfaction from the top and the bottom has been very important in terms of really giving space and opportunity for these Chinese elites to present themselves as now presenting new and viable ways to think about global governance. And I think the last thing to also ask ourselves as we acknowledge we are in the early days of China's new foreign policy vocabulary and efforts is whether or not these suites of global public goods will in, in turn also shift. So just as much as we've had the BRI plus GCI, GDI, GSI, or sometimes just GDI, GSI, and GCI referenced, I would like to flag that there is one more predating global initiative, this global initiative on data security, um, which came out in September of 2020. Um, this one has had a lot more space in terms of targeted UN um, cyber negotiations and also the South, I'm um, sorry, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SCO. But it's quite interesting to me at least to see that this has not been elevated in terms of being a particular global initiative. And so sort of questions about where Chinese elites are thinking um, and the configuration of what these global initiatives will be, I think that's something to keep our eyes on too. And I'll stop there. I look forward to the Q&A, thanks. Thank you, Courtney, and thank you all for those really wonderful presentations. I think the audience can see very clearly uh, lots of connections among them, and we have uh, plenty of time for your questions that we'll seek to, to make those connections. Um, let me begin, uh, if I could, with a question uh, I've been uh, formulating in chat with uh, my, my colleagues at ICI, and that is that I think um, in all of your uh, talks in one way or another, whether it is the future of co-evolutionary pragmatism and these interesting zones that, that Xiaoyang refers to, whether it is to uh, one of Min's final points about uh, the global north very likely opposing this big green uh, uh, BRI, green sector push, whether it is, uh, as Jennifer pointed out in her final remarks, also some of the uh, limitations and, and geopolitical contexts of, of these uh, projects that she described in, in very close detail, or as I think maybe most clearly, uh, Courtney is uh, signaling or, or flagging uh, some of the, um, the uh, I guess, challenges to uh, the, uh, the, the defenders and protectors of the global, uh, the liberal international order and its status quo. And so uh, to, to put that all into one question, um, what are the biggest risks confronting China's international development practices uh, down the road, both short term and long term, as, as you see them from your uh, respective uh, positions and what you covered today? Anybody who wants to begin first, uh, please feel free to do so. Oh, yeah, go ahead. 
Maybe I'll just uh, quickly say one thing. I think health uh, and education might be the easiest uh, one to re respond. Uh, uh, what I see, China will probably continue uh, its effort in this area, but uh, the program and project for the types and the format and the governance uh, really need to uh, be continued to evolve to fit the current global health uh, agenda, uh, which is focusing on the regional and uh, global surveillance uh, for uh, the, the emerging uh, infectious diseases and also strengthening uh, the local uh, health the, the system and how to engage, how to cross engage with UN system multilateral uh, uh, organizations. I think that's the challenge. Cheyenne, do you want to go first? Uh, oh, oh, uh, no, 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 please. Hey, I, I, oh. I, I, I think it's... Yeah, okay. So, so I'm, I'm a believer in capitalism. <laughs> so I think that the, the biggest hurdle to China is the Chinese capitalism. The, the development story uh, faces a lot of hurdle. Uh, the, uh, the, the, they, they were able to, uh, to, to gain this extended lifeline of, of economic uh, development to green transition domestically. Uh, but so far, um, the uh, the next stage, like whether China can utilize uh, green developments uh, to substitute the the the, the other uh, weakened uh, industrial spots, economic area, that's 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 doubtful. Uh, and externally, the the resources available for China to tap on is quite uh, limited, so so uh, so that's where the global north um, uh, uh, pushback or containment uh, it will be quite damaging because for for uh, for capital. Uh, industrial uh, reorientation, you need to have a lot of financial resources uh, injection. And in uh, China, I'm, I'm not sure it's domestic organic uh, capital is sufficient. And then, then globally, the, the, um, the financing environment toward the Chinese uh, investments and uh, uh, expansion is, uh, is quite hostile. Um, if I may just jump in, um, I, I think actually what we'll see here, Mark, in terms of these three different global initiatives, is I think we're actually seeing um, a variation in the way that there is response to China. So I think, again, part of this, and I know this sounds very, very vague, but I think part of this is it's almost this attempt to try and present a fait accompli. If I talk about if I tell you enough times that I am providing these global public goods, and I tell you enough times that there is this community of common destiny, in many ways, we can almost speak it into existence. And I know this sounds very broad, but this concept that we can somehow write about it, get it into UN initiatives, get it published, um, find sponsorship for it, find a champion within the UN system, helps make this very broad idea of this community of common destiny very real. And I think in many ways, the development space has been one of those spaces where China has had great success because ultimately they are willing to fund, they are willing to become a policy champion, and they are able to enter a discussion at a time when there is um, perhaps less enthusiasm for looking for the more traditional north-south responses to many of the key development issues that the UN is meant to be addressing. Um, but I think, again, GCI is potentially one of those areas where China could have a lot of policy success. There's numerous spaces to enter the discussion. Um, Chinese diplomats have very well learned how to utilize the rules of the system to help benefit China's idea promotion. So whether that means bringing in more speakers that will support Chinese views in particular forum, or enlarging the number of Chinese delegation sizes to make sure that there is enough presence to help negotiate across all the different breakout groups. None of this is necessarily rule breaking, 
Um, but this is essentially learning how to play the game better. And for an area that China is invested in, for example, on questions of human rights, we can see a lot of impact um, in that particular space. But I do think, I don't know about pushback, but I think there certainly will be friction, for example, on this sort of more security space. Um, if we haven't seen it already, I think in part, a lot of suspicion about what China is really talking about. And I think, again, a lot of concern that a lot of the first order security problems, and again, as I discussed, right, part of this inflection point is this connection between security and development. But for those that want to talk about security as a security problem, um, I think GSI leaves a lot of question marks still, and the responses on that are maybe at best latent. So I think, again, that's where there's potentially a lot more sort of question marks and therefore pushback and Q&A being raised um, in that particular space. Thanks. Yeah, I think for China's uh, in this uh, new uh, yeah, uh, geopolitical conditions, China's uh, response, maybe we should see some like a more short term uh, response. Uh, and uh, uh, as a, yeah, the e economy, it's actually facing uh, pressure. And uh, then also the, because of the high interest rate and China may have some uh, temporary uh, measures, but uh, how uh, will that uh, like uh, change the long term trend? Perhaps uh, uh, I would uh, say actually China's uh, policy hasn't uh, really like substantially changed for the long run. It's uh, still uh, it's just uh, like this uh, temporary fluctuation is also actually a part of this flexibility in the long run. So uh, yeah, this is just uh, my some like uh, my observation, and uh, yeah, we we can f further elaborate when more questions come. Thanks. Those are really helpful responses, and maybe shifting it a little bit. And this is a question uh, from Manjuri uh, about the um, noticing that the the presentation's uh, common thread among them is how going global is driven by these domestic uh, imperatives, uh, whether it be the need to sustain industrial growth. There's a, a an audience question uh, about this too. Um, uh, or whether it, it is to find new resources in markets, uh, whether it is to combat Cold War and recent U.S.-driven exclusions from global institutions, new ideological shifts uh, even within China. Um, so uh, what, what might be called a supply-side model um, is out there, but is there any consideration um, of needs and demands uh, of African countries, the poor countries, the recipient or host countries on their own terms. Um, uh, so uh, would people like to, to uh, consider uh, those questions, the extent to which um, there's, it's not just a, maybe a supply, it's supply side, but it's maybe one size fits all. Um, and is there any careful tailoring of, of you know, a group as, as diverse and heterogeneous as the so-called global South would be, can it really be the case that these um, uh, strategies are all going to be, um, you know, mm -hmm. carefully, they're going to be effective one. And I guess also uh, getting back to the question of, of risk and pushback, could, could that happen? Mm. Shanyang, do you um, want to comment on the okay. Africa yeah. government? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I can speak. I think this uh, view of, uh, whether you think about the demand side, mm, in fact, sometimes this is a rather like a traditional donor's uh, way of thinking. You are, uh, while you are, uh, you are giving, then you think uh, in like uh, what the recipients are uh, need, uh, and then you even try to care for them and design for them. But actually Chinese doesn't think like, do not think like this way. Because China is doing business, as uh, I said, yeah, it's uh, actually the capitalist way of cooperation. It's uh, the aid is always a small part, just a quite a small portion. And uh, so when China is thinking about uh, other partners' needs, certainly they think about them, but uh, in the way of just uh, let's uh, reach a, a deal which are beneficial for both sides. 
So it's never less you say, oh, I try to move to your position and think in your way. But China is actually when I am, I'm doing business and uh, this should be good uh, for our both. Do you agree? And uh, yeah, and uh, if you agree, then we reach this, uh, yeah, we make a deal. And uh, if you do not agree, then let's uh, uh, try another way or revise the deal to make it more satisfactory for uh, both sides. And I think this is uh, how I see the yeah pattern is working. So I think uh, yeah, it's a uh, yeah, perspective is quite a thinking pattern is quite a different from a donor, it's a traditional donors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll comment from the uh, global uh, perspective. Uh, I um uh, I, I agree with uh, um, Xiao Yan's points um, on on Chinese thinking, uh, but uh, but it is also a demand driven uh, world, and so from from that point of view, China's offering of the three GDI, GIs uh, as Courtney was pointing out, right, that was meeting a demand from the global South from a lot of. Uh, members of the international community, the infrastructure-led BRI 1.0 was also meeting a, a huge demand in the world in terms of infrastructure deficit. And currently, in the last five years, as China was developing its green industry, it was also thinking about the huge demand globally in terms of green transition. So, so it's not only supply, it's actually demand driven story. But the, uh, the reality is the global order is incredibly unjust and the global capital market is not, is, is not, is not really operating according demand and supply per se. Uh, the, the, the relative uh, wealth concentration is quite different. So that's where, that's a part that I'm more skeptical or more pessimistic than, than Xiaoyang's argument, because I, 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 I think given the concentrated capital in the global north, that's, that's, that's more restrictive for uh, collaborating with China, the global south, uh, it will, it's, it's still very huge demand for China and there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration, but it's, it in itself is not heavy enough to carry or resourceful enough to carry um, uh, China onward. Uh, I, uh, I, to address the question in the chat to me, I will mention a couple um, bright spots uh, for, for China's green BRI. Uh, and these countries are, are relatively significant in the global South and are relatively open to China's uh, uh, green uh, collaboration. And so, so if, if we're thinking about bright spot, this, this might be. Um, so Brazil is a, a, a huge bright spot for China. It's not BRI uh, sign, signing country, but uh, the the Brazil uh, it, for its own um, for its own national uh, objective of green development, it has really embraced China's green collaboration. So Brazil is like the top among the top recipients for most of China's green exports and projects. Uh, Indonesia is also a, a, a pretty eager recipient for for China's uh, infrastructure development. Thailand is aiming as the, 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 the supply, as a recipient of the supply networks in the, uh, in the green production. Uh, so Hungary in, in, in Europe, uh, in the, going against the EU's general uh, position, uh, Hungary actually is, is also collaborating. Then we have Middle East and Africa that are, 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 are presenting a lot of opportunities. So my uh, pessimism is uh, rooted in this global transformation. And by, by I, I am optimistic in these various you know, uh, um, bilateral synergies, uh, complementary development in, in, in quite the critical global South markets. Okay. If I can say one word oh, on, on this topic um, is 
Um, we all know that health and education are usually uh, the projects targeting at soft uh, soft power, uh, which is helping China's uh, image in the country, in the region. And we also, from the analysis, seeing how that uh, distribution changed uh, on different times. At different time, but I I think I would also mention some of the problems with soft power. Uh, that if it's not done well, it you know as we can see some of the vaccine issues uh, during COVID um, and, and medical products uh, that's making these projects very vulnerable for criticism if it's not well evaluated and if the transparency. Uh, is uh, not clear, is not done. Uh, and sometimes also when uh, the motivation uh, is focusing on the market or other security geopolitics issues. Thank you. We're getting a lot of questions uh, coming in and we have uh, four minutes remaining, unfortunately. Let me try to pull together a few threads and, and give each of you uh, maybe one one more round of, of comments. Um, so one is obviously the context of uh, the the PRC's domestic economic slowdown, uh, whether it's in, in slower growth or actual uh, debt driven kinds of constraints and crises. Um, how is this going to, uh, to uh, influence influence the ability to leverage development resources globally to support? Uh, the GDI and other uh, areas of financial commitments. Um, uh, related to that, a, a second question, these are uh, from anonymous attendees. Um, what do you see as the possible future trend of China's development finance? And we're gonna talk about finance tomorrow, by the way, reminding the audience. Um, but it, uh, while we have time today, how, how would that, uh, again, the domestic slowdown uh, influence uh, finance capabilities. Um, and uh, and then I'll squeeze in a, a quick uh, a partial question from, from our, our colleague, Sakiko Fukuda-Par, who wanted to uh, ask uh, Courtney in particular to elaborate a little bit on how you're using the concept of global public goods. Is that uh, being, you know, and what it's referring to specifically or broadly? So if you have a chance, uh, Courtney, to, to um, develop that a little bit. Okay, I'll turn it over to each of you uh, for the first question and for all four of you for the first question and Courtney in particular on global public goods that China's providing. So again, let me jump in first. The the finance uh, is a, is a huge issue. Uh, even though the health and education programs are small and beautiful, but still, uh, I, I think, for example, the vaccine is a big push. Um, so I am waiting to see how, especially with the economic situation uh, recently in China, how that would affect uh, these uh, products. Uh, that's to be to be seen. Uh, yeah. Thanks. And Xiaoyang, are we looking at a, a okay. Marxian uh, cycle of crisis following overproduction? Uh, it's not overproduction. And uh, I think it's uh, also the global south doesn't just depend on China to provide uh, the capital. And uh, actually, I would say the Middle East, uh, they are some new players and uh, which uh, uh, may uh, play a big role. And uh, China is uh, expanding its uh, uh, international cooperation with this uh, Middle East uh, and some emerging like uh, economies to together work. And actually, China, I would also say, very welcome uh, any other like uh, 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 lenders or investors all together in the global south since this is a hugely challenging task and china if if it depends on china alone certainly that will be difficult and uh, current this uh, economic uh, slowdown it will uh, yeah kind of hinder its uh, steps but uh, on the other hand, China is not really, is actually also experiencing transition. 
So in some sectors, they are performing quite well, like the new, uh, re uh, the new renewable energy and also the even the digital sector. I think China is still expanding globally. They may just change from the traditional infrastructure projects to more uh, yeah, this, uh, new sectors. So uh, yeah, when you see this temporary slowdown, it also we, together uh combined with some uh, uh sector transition as well yeah so. okay thank you and i'm sorry to ask uh mean and courtney to to give us a, a 60 second each uh, uh response if possible because we are up against time okay so i'll be uh i'll be brief i i i, I agree that the, the the chinese um uh, domestic story will be decisive and i think there are two uh two bright spots, but both very challenging and bumpy bright spots. One is Chinese consumers. You know, can Chinese consumers carry yeah. the Chinese economy? Uh, so far last year, the the consumers uh, uh, expanding is increasing. So it's a it's a it's a, a consumption growth is much much faster than the national GDP. So we'll see how this maintain. The second is the Chinese entrepreneurs. These are real private capitalists. Can the private capitalists join the green transition more effectively? And so far, I think last year, they, they, uh, the Chinese government is pushing for the transition financing. That is all kinds of investment mechanisms will turn the traditional factories into more greener factories. This is a huge, huge business uh, opportunities, but so far how this can make the private capital more involved and more profitable. We need to look at the Chinese entrepreneurs' behavior. Um, so thank you very much for the question. I think it's important to point out that traditional definitions of public goods um, rely upon two um, variables. One, that the good itself has to be non-rivalrous. So my use of it does not mean you can does not prevent you from using it, and also non-exclusionary. So therefore, it is always available um, to play for all. So for example, a lighthouse is the typical example offered. One ship using the light to navigate dangerous waters does not prevent another ship or any other ship from turning up and using the light um, to do the same function. And so in many ways, um, the reason why this term is applied to international politics is the sense that great states, leading powers provide global public goods. That's been one of sort of the ongoing themes about how we identify what a great state is, minus sort of military balance calculations, for example. And so in many ways, these global public goods, for example, like keeping um, sea lanes open and safe for all to use, um, even though only certain states can afford to you know, send out aircraft carriers send out their navies. Um, this function is meant to provide safety and security for all players um, within economic and security spaces. So I think this push to sort of use this language as a global security provider is also to recognize China's own rise to its own great power st status, but also it's also implicit pushback against I think a lot of the other terms that have been applied to Beijing. So again, the purposeful development of this term stakeholder, responsible stakeholder, knowing that there was no such term equivalent in Chinese. Um, the pushback on the most recent US efforts to talk about China as quote, a global security provider. Again, knowing that there was not clear understandings about what global security provider meant um, about 10, 15 years ago. And again, the consistent um, criticisms that China is quote, a free rider um, within global governance. So again, to answer your question more precisely, um, I think the understanding of what these global public goods can be tangible and tactical, i.e. building a bridge, and you can see the bridge being built, it is also broad and vague, um, this concept of security as defined under Chinese um, preferences. Thanks. Well, thank you to each of the panelists for those really stimulating comments. I think the series is off to a, an excellent start. I want to also thank Karen for uh, organizing this uh, and she, uh, also letting people know that she's been just a, a wonderful postdoctoral uh, fellow to engage with this year. And we're going to miss her very much uh, when she resumes her, uh, takes on her first position uh, next year as a, as a professor at Davidson College. Uh, I will also thank uh, the team at ICI, including uh, especially Grace Ho, our deputy director, my colleague, Manjari Mahajan, 
uh, Michael at IT at the New School and wishing you all a very happy day and evening. And we'll see you uh, in a little less than 24 hours for the next uh, panel in this series.